Hello and welcome to another episode of Your One Black Friend and I am your host, Jolie. You can call me Joe. Thank you guys so much for hanging in there as I transition away from social media and towards YouTube and podcasting and my own website eventually, sometime soon. First and foremost, I wanted to kind of jump in and start a conversation about Samsung. So apparently Samsung, I know random, right? Apparently Samsung, there's a video on YouTube called Samsung Got Caught. And this was posted into our Telegram group by um, Alwyn and Dana. So Dana had posted a picture one of her friends sent to her where the moon, there appeared to be two moons in the picture that she took. And she was like, well, what do you guys make of this? Now, because she didn't see it with her own eyes, um, we just kind of assumed that, well, maybe there was a reflection in the mirror. But Alwyn, another member of the Telegram group, popped in there and was like, actually, there's this AI function, or what Samsung is telling us is an AI function. And by telling us, I mean they quietly like slid it in where most Samsung u- users don't know this, but there's a function in your Samsung phone. So they advertise their Space Zoom, iSpace Zoom, I think it's called an iBreak Space Zoom feature on your Samsung. And they tell people that the Zoom is so powerful on a Samsung phone that it could take a picture of the moon. It's just a straight up lie, turns out. Um, I'm not sure how they haven't gotten sued yet for false advertisement, but apparently in real time, what, and there's a Reddit um, post about this that I think had like 9 million views or something like that up to this point now. But apparently what they did is that they, when you take a picture of the moon, they use some sort of metrics to like figure out that you are taking a picture of the moon and then they superimpose an actual photo of the moon that has been taken with a much better camera over your phone's picture and it's happening in real time. It happens in real time. So you take a picture of the moon, like you zoom into the moon and as it appears to be focusing, what it's actually doing, (laughs) it's kind of fucked up. What it's actually doing is just superimposing like a picture of the moon that you can find on Google over your picture in real time. I just, the layers of how fucked up that is, I mean, that's just straight up like false advertisement to begin with, because that's, you're telling me, you're selling a camera, and a lot of people in this video, the video is called Samsung Got Caught, you can find it on YouTube, but a lot of people, well, a couple of people, there are some people who are just like, well, how is that any different than using like, you know, face, whatever those filters are that changes your face. Um, it's different because you didn't sell a whole camera on the premise that you can do something that it's not actually doing, like they're lying to their users, All right? So one person commented a comment that I thought, yeah, this is a critical thinker in this comment. And they were saying, well, I know a lot of people who switched over to Samsung because of the Zoom, <laughs> the, the Zoom power on that was advertised on this phone and then it just turns out they're literally just superimposing a better picture of the moon so they lie i I just keep repeating because like it's wild to me so they lied in their advertisement and said this feature is powerful enough to zoom into the moon and then you buy this phone and they just superimpose a photo of the moon over your (laughs) that's wild to me that that's just wild to me and now somebody else was like Another, like a better critical thinker, they left the comments and I actually want to read the comments because I was very impressed. I'm always impressed by people who think outside the box and don't, excuse me, I was like listening to a book. People who think outside the box and don't just like accept things at face value. This person said, and it was Maxim Telegas, who said, if we can't trust the data from cameras because it is being rewritten, then bad actors could literally get away with anything. Right. Because if you if you're taking if you're taking a picture on your phone, we are operating with a premise with the mindset that this is happening in real time. So if you're taking a picture on your phone, the assumption is that, well, what I capture is what I'm actually seeing with my eyeballs. And of course, we all know that, like, you know, that doesn't often happen. A lot of the times when you take a picture of something that you see. A UFO, for example, right? <laughs> right, and then you look on your phone. It's like that's not what I see, or even like a moon. Like I've seen some pretty intense moons, and when you go and try to take a picture of it, it doesn't show. 
but we're operating under the premise that what you take a picture of, like your actual camera is capturing what's your, what you're seeing, or at least as close to what it is that you're seeing so that you can then share the information that's being edited. And you could look at it at face value and look at it. Okay. Like best case scenario, they were just trying to sell cameras, but worst case scenario, this, this editing in real time in your camera can be used nefariously. And this technology, I mean, that's a lot of energy. If you watch the video, it's a lot of um, computing, like pro power by like, processing that's being put into, into just something as simple as that. What else has been happening and how long has this technology existed? Because I can't tell you how many times I've seen like a strange anomaly with my own eyes and the night in the last few years. And then I try to capture it on my phone and it's not there. It's nothing. How do we know that that's not just like a function that's been built into the phone where that's just being edited out, that it's literally built, built into your phone that any sort of anomaly in the night sky will just get edited out. So that I can't honestly like convey what it is that I'm seeing. Like I'm honestly thinking I'm going to just get a Polaroid because what the fuck, right? Like imagine what else can just be edited out? And this is just something just, it seems benign. It seems like, you know, as other people in the comments were saying, well, you know, uh, it's not any different from like using Photoshop. No, it is. It is a difference from using Photoshop because when I'm using Photoshop to edit a picture, I'm sitting at my desktop and I know that I'm editing the picture. When I go to take a picture, I expect my camera to accurate, accurately represent what it is that I'm seeing to capture. Yes. After the fact, I might go in and tweak it, but that's at least my choice. There are some people who take pictures because they want to be able to like edit things or they want to be able to share things, not edit things, rather they want to be able to capture things and they want to be able to share things. So the expectation now, if you're taking a picture with your phone, like that's gone. And then you take that a step further out. And if they have the mindset to do something like this with something as simple and as silly as the moon, and they're willing to put that kind of computing power to that, to live in real time editing, <laughs> editing things that you see in your eyes, like changing that and superimposing another pre-existing picture over what it is that you're trying to capture, then let's extrapolate that and what it is that we're not aware of that might be happening. And to me, that calls into the effect now, the Mandela effect, right? All of these people who are saying, I remember things being this, I remember this, but what are we all programmed to do? To go into the internet, type stuff out and like try to find things to support what it is that we remember. But unfortunately, right, we can't find a lot of evidence. And so we, this whole time, since people have been reporting on the Mandela effect, it's been a lot of like back and forth. There are people who will hop online and try to argue with other people's memories and saying you're just misremembering and there's no evidence on the internet to support what it is that you're saying. But who is to say, I mean, at this point, it's not hard to in real time scrub data from the internet. Apparently it's not, it's not hard to in real time scrub an image as you're taking a picture of it. Like I, I, this should be a bigger news than it is. And it, it should, it should absolutely, it should at the very least be, be alarming to you. It should alarm you. Just something I wanted to kind of share with you on that, just to be aware that that is something that, that that can happen, that is happening, that does exist. And really using your mental, you know, sort of using your brain to logically assume or to, to make logical conclusions as in like, if this is possible, then what else is possible? What else can just be edited out in real time? Our, I mean, we know this, but it's worth reiterating our search engines trustworthy and not just Google, you know, DuckDuckGo brave as well. How from this point on, are we able to share information <laughs> if these things can be doctored in real time? And should we maybe be thinking about other ways to transmit information? I, I keep sort of pushing for advocacy. Um, I'm sorry. I keep sort of advocating now, now that I've seen the light, 
um, that maybe we should start doing interactions more on one on one and off this, off this thing, off these things, use technology, all right, but only up to a certain point, but to be so dependent on it to the point where you destruct your own observations or distrust your own observations, maybe that should kind of be put to the side and just trust what it is that you remember. All right. Just maybe trust what it is that you remember. Even if there are people around you who appear to be saying otherwise, because for example, you see this in social media, there is a bot problem. There was a video I posted on my YouTube channel. Um, I won't be able to pull it up right now. I don't think, but it is in my, I think what you do like announcements or something, I'm still getting used to it. But in my announcements there's a video, maybe I can find, let's see if I can find the title. This is fun. I like being I like being on my desktop. Normally I just record from my, from my phone, but let's see. And, but obviously when I'm recording from my phone, I can't like in real time, look up stuff. This is me clearly stalling so that I can find this video. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. It's something about like everything on the internet being fake. It's a conspiracy theory video. Let's see. Hold on. Look what I can do. Check this out. There's a pause button. Um, it's called, it's all fake. The dead internet theory by the Y files. Sorry. I just coughed and I was able to just pause it. It's so cool. Sorry. I'm like easily amused. Um, but in it's on YouTube, find the video in this video is basically talk about how basically everything, well, the majority of things on the internet could have already been computer generated before the general public, I'm paraphrasing, but before the general public became aware of AI and its capability of like generating content. And now more and more people are, you know, like a lot more and more publishers are now having to put on their articles that this is AI generated. The theory is more or less saying that, well, this was, they were already capable of doing this a long time ago and that real people, she says, looking at her YouTube channel where she's got, <laughs> that has existed for 10 years and yet only have like 2000, what, 500 subscribers, which is not a complaint. I love you guys and I'm grateful for you. But this video says that real like creators, like real human creators will get suppressed because they actually don't want real human creators to be able to access and to reach people. So computer generated, AI generated content is, will get pushed out, but the majority of people and the majority of articles and the majority of individuals that you're interacting with on the internet may not actually be real people. And that this has been going on since before we were even aware that such a thing was possible. That's, I mean, it's, it's one thing because I do say it, I I've said it quite a lot. Like we need to understand and operate from the premise that uh, what we think of a lot of what we think of we're capable of technologically. We are about 50 years behind what they are actually capable of. So you really do have to just like take a step back and question everything. And when I say things like that, I have the head knowledge. And yet when I run into experiences or examples rather like the Samsung thing, I'm, I'm still, which may be a good thing, but I'm still like, wow, what is going on? Because more and more, it, it does feel like, I don't want to say it's giving prison planet. I, I, you guys know how I feel about that, but gosh, what is going on? And what is, what is, what is, what is, what is, I should just say, what is, I have a sort of a running, um, like a conversation I have with, uh, my friend Maya. Uh, she was featured uh, two episodes ago and I told her, I think there's more than seven continents because why the fuck not? Like, <laughs> I mean, honestly, at this point, if we have been systematically lied to about everything, then you really do need to question everything. And I do have this theory that there's more than seven continents and you guys have probably heard me talk about this before. And there's more than seven seas and that what we are shown of earth it's just like a small microcosm of what this world actually is. If there was more to this world, like let's say we've got like, this is what we're shown the earth is, but earth is actually like this big. How would you know? Like, you don't know. 
We don't know. I don't know. I, I don't even know how I would even start being. I, I don't have access to millions of dollars that will allow me to go in a spaceship. And even then, I can't, we can't get past low Earth orbit. Like, we can't. I have a video that I put together on why I think, reasons why I think we have not yet, we never went to the moon. I haven't published it because I honestly don't want a lot of people like seeing it. I may post it to the Telegram group. If you guys want to see it, leave a comment and I'll post it to the Telegram group. It's unlisted right now. But it's basically basically a compilation of different, like like the president, Obama, a couple of NASA scientists, and um, other people as well who keep repeated, repeating that we can't get past low Earth orbit. And I broke down how far, like, the the International Space Station like how far from earth the international space station actually travels. Um, and then how far from that the actual moon is, which is like way, <laughs> it's like, actually, I also have a clip on there. And Neil deGrasse Tyson basically says the same thing. He holds the globe and he says, okay, this is earth. This is where the space, um, the space jump occurred. This is where the ISS travels. And we can't get past this. And then he was like, and the room, uh, the moon is like 15 feet away, like in the other room. And I was like, what is he low key trying to say without saying it? I got to like, maybe I'll publish it. Who cares? I don't know. But I, maybe I can publish it and turn off the comments. That is something else I could do. I just remember that I could do that. But I also broke down like the different temperature um, in which like for the different type of atmospheres, like between earth, right? There's like the mesosphere, the exosphere, all this other like different, but they're, they're all like the thermosphere, um, ionosphere, and then the temperature of each like atmosphere. And then I broke down the, uh, temperature in which different material melts. And then I broke down like what the international space station is made from today. And then what Apollo, I think it was like Apollo 11, whatever it's called the the spaceship that went to the moon i broke down like what it was made out of like aluminum like fiberglass and shit like that and then i i found out what like how hot each atmosphere gets and then at what like temperature these materials that these um spacecrafts were made of would melt and let's just say the math wasn't mathing so it was just a bunch of different things so if that if that can be a hoax or people to this day are still arguing to me it's a no-brainer you can't tell me that we can't can't repeatedly say that we can't get past low earth orbit you can't repeatedly talk about the van allen radiation belt and how to get human beings past a certain you know um radiation belt safely and they're still working on having you know being able to do that now you can't turn around and say we no longer possess the technologies to go to the moon in 2022 i think when they were saying this or 2020 something like that or whatever um and they're repeatedly saying it that we we don't have the technology now that we did in the 60s that's just an insult to our intelligence like i i, I don't understand why they it, they're saying that out loud, right? So all of these things, I put it together in this video and somehow we're supposed to just ignore all of that and say that, yes, we went to the moon. I, I just, I don't believe it. I have my theories as to why they did it. My theory is pretty simple. We were in a cold war with Russia. We wanted to beat our chest and say we did something that they didn't do. The scientists then decided to pull, you know, a hoax or whatever. And it's like, how we we fuck you we went to the moon right and since then our modern scientists have been trying to figure out a way to actually go to the moon to actually send people to the moon and that's why they're coming out and saying it because on some level they know that there was a hoax but they don't want to come out and say that it was a hoax because of obvious reasons so they won't but my 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 thinking is that if they falsified that which they did um and everything that we've been going through the last like three, four years at least, and everything that we have experienced, everything that we've learned to later find out was not true, then anything's up for grabs. And I genuinely think just like there are isolated tribes in like the rainforest and Amazon, whatever, they're uncontacted tribes is what they're called. And every time a plane kind of flies above, like they look up and they're like interesting or what the fuck is that, <laughs> whatever it is. I think the same thing is happening to us. But, but with UFOs and it just keeps like 
expanding. I, I honestly think that there's more to seven continents. We're just like the uncontacted tribes of like some greater civilization. That's my opinion. And then it kind of lends itself. Then you almost want to start talking about like the concept of gods and aliens, right? I've, I've just finished reading the book, The Unseen Realm by Michael Heiser. And I, I don't, you know, you guys know how much I love books. I would not recommend that book unless you want to hate read it because <laughs> that's what I did. I, I read it, the entire book like repeatedly. It took me about two weeks to get through to it. Like, and you guys know how quickly I go through books. I take my time. Like I actually created little videos to share with um, my friends about like just certain sections. And then I'm like arguing on the video about why this section is wrong. <laughs> like he's wrong about this because what this author did, I found the book to be intellectually dishonest. And what I mean by that is that this author, um, he wrote the book operating from a premise where it was subjective. He wanted to, <laughs> He saw or he sees his religion a particular way. So his premise is that his God is the one true God and all other gods are demons. And so his God, Yahweh, he's a Christian. His God, Yahweh, is the one true God. And all other gods are demons. And even though Elohim, it's mentioned in the Bible several times, does refer to a plural, plu plurality, there we go, of gods, a pantheon of gods. He says that that pantheon of gods aren't actually gods. They're a part of Yahweh's council. The only God that actually is God is Yahweh. And then proceeds to talk about other gods and how the Israelites kept like forsaking Yahweh to worship like Baal and, <laughs> and how they would make sacrifices to Azazel. And um, all these other sort of regional gods, but he then denigrates these regional gods and keeps insisting that no, but Yahweh is the only God. That was infuriating to me. I, I, if if you're if you're if you're if you are intellectually honest and you are able to present a fact, it may go against what you want to believe about your Bible. Don't put out a book. Then go and preach. I would have preferred a book. That was just like, this is what it is. And to en encourage listeners or readers to form their own conclusion instead of trying to shift people to accept his conclusions that were directly contradicting what he was actually saying. But I suppose that's how that religion works, right? It's not a matter of just trusting or it's not a matter of trusting your own intellectual sort of conclusions. It's a matter of more just this is in the information and blindly accept what I'm telling you, even if it directly conclude or contradicts what it is that I'm actually saying. That said, it was worth it for me to get bits of information and to like have at least an academic proof of what it is that I'd kind of always suspected about the biblical stories, about Yahweh um, himself, about the the serpent, the Nahash, um, that was mentioned in the book of Genesis, and to form my own conclusion. So that's gonna get pulled into. I'm gonna I use it as a good resource to now feed like a narrative story that I'm presently working on about God's souls and things like that. And I'm gonna go, I'm gonna give you guys some some hints and clues. But then there were other things that was like right in front of his face that he just missed because he was blinded by own, his own beliefs, which reminds me of the writings of, um, oh, what's his name? Robert Anton Wilson in the Cosmic Trigger, Trigger books. You guys know I like to, I like to pump him and I pump, I, I love his books, but he says like, avoid belief systems because they trap you, they close your mind. And I would say are absolutely the author, Michael Heiser, Absolutely. I've never seen so many, like so much mental gymnastics happen in real time, like to, to just avoid what it is that was actually coming out of your own mouth. It was wild to me to just miss things that he was actually saying and then form other conclusions. For example, he says that Yah well, like Yahweh is the only one true God. There are no other gods and that the ancient Israelites 
were not monotheist. I'm sorry, were not polytheistic, that they were monotheistic. And then proceeds to tell a story about how they would like keep worshiping other gods. Unless he doesn't know the definition of like polytheistic, he's not listening to what he's writing. They were absolutely polytheistic. That's why Yahweh kept getting mad <laughs> because they kept wanting to worship other gods. And he kept saying, I am a jealous God. You will have no other God before me. He wouldn't be saying that if they weren't doing things that were upsetting him, like worshiping other gods. In the story, for example, of when Moses goes up to the Mount, I think it was Mount Sinai or something like that to get the 10 commandments, or it may have been like 20 commandments. And then he got mad and broke one. <laughs> The whole thing's funny to me. Um, but then it was like, oh shit, okay, well, I got to. But when he goes up to talk to Yahweh and Yahweh like inscribes all of these laws, he comes back down. The Israelites that had just been like liberated from Egypt are worshiping a golden calf. And that's why Moses gets mad and throws it. I threw it on the ground. Like he throws it on the ground. He throws the commandments on the ground. That wouldn't have pissed them off if there was only one God. And if the ancient Israelites truly believed that they were only, there was a whole pantheon of gods. And he goes forth in the book and names all the different gods in that pantheon. Not all of them, but a lot of them. From my understanding, I will say this, there was a lot of good information in the book. Like I said, it was just, he presented information, but still insisted on steering the readers to his bullshit belief system bs and i i don't i don't think that's fair that's not right to me it's just outright not right okay but i will say that there was there were bits of information that i found fascinating and interesting you guys remember a video i did a while back should be my youtube somewhere where i'm like kind of close to the camera and i'm talking about who did yahweh or i didn't say yahweh at the time but now i know the name his name is yahweh uh and i'm i'm, I'm, I'm insisting on actually naming this god because what it does is once by naming him Yahweh, it allows me to bring him down to the level where he's not the supreme God. Because that idea of calling him God feeds into the Christian narrative that any other culture's gods are false gods except for him. So I no longer will subscribe to that. Which funny enough, this book, Unseen Realm, actually helped me do that. Right? So when you say God and you're thinking of the Christian God, you're falling into that mindset of like raising him over all these other gods, which even by the ancient Israelites own admissions, there were other gods that were on the same level as Yahweh. Baal himself was worshipped by the Israelites. The author concludes that and says that that there was some competition between the two and that at one point, even though Yahweh defeated Baal, he lost, Yahweh lost a lot of his followers to the same Baal guy, which by the way, I'm going to get back to what this have to do with there being more than, you know, um, more than seven continents and aliens as well. I mean, I'm trying to remember, let me write that down so I can do that now. Um, but there was a video I did where I asked, well, who did Christ get sacrificed to, right? Because you guys remember the story, right? God loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Well, Christ was a blood sacrifice. And so he clearly had to sacrifice Christ to somebody in order to absolve humanity of their sins, which that is a whole nother, like, that's not accurate. But that's, that's not, I don't even think I'm going to have time to talk about it in this video, but or this episode as well. But I had asked, who was he sacrificing Christ to? Because it was a sacrifice. Was he sacrificing him, his son to himself? Well, all he had to do was forgive the sins, right? Or was he sacrificing his son to Satan? Which at the time, right, I, I think I used the word Satan, but Satan, I found out, and I kind of knew this, but it was good to have like a reference to be able to say like, this is it even though he then turned around and directly contradicts his own conclusion. But he had concluded earlier in the book that there was really no Satan the way we understand Satan. 
Satan was not a name. Satan was a title, the Satan. And he was essentially a member of Yahweh's like council, his pantheon that worked for Yahweh. And his job was to go and act as accuser, to go down to earth and essentially try humans to find out if they were worthy. He was like an adversary or something like that. Um, definitely worth Googling or looking into to find that out. But it, there wasn't, there's a lot of like misunderstanding in the, in, in Christianity to be completely honest, because there's a lot of conflation between Lucifer, Satan, the devil, um, Beelzebub, <laughs> like Azazel, all of these things. But the, what I will say the author did a good job in the unseen realm of, of pointing out was that the serpent and it wasn't necessarily an actual snake. And he even did a good job of saying that, that it was not an actual snake, that it was something serpentine or that there might have been something with the name Nahash. And I'll come back to that. I'm going to try to remember, come back to Nahash, um, but it not being a serpent. But he was saying that the, the serpent or the snake or the like Lucifer, whatever, whatever that entity is that was in um, the beginning in Eden, the tempted Eve is not Satan. Satan shows up to go down to talk to Job and essentially, but he is sent down. That's why it doesn't make any sense that if, if it was Satan in in the Bible in the beginning in Genesis, they got cast out of Eden and cursed to crawl in his belly. Then why would he then later on show up (laughs) in heaven again? If I'd already, if he'd already been cast down to hell, why would he then show up in heaven again to then go and mess with Job? Like what's going on? But it was because these are not the same entity, but somehow it all has gotten over time kind of thrown in together and hell and sacrifice and things like that. So it's all very confused because essentially what religion is, is especially in my opinion, what I've observed with this particular religion, and I can speak openly about it and honestly about it because that was a religion that I practiced the majority of my life. As some of you know, it's been like a a game of Chinese whispers for about 2000 years. Books have been taken out. Books have been added in. There's so many translations. Sometimes when a word is translated, the biases of the translator blind them from translating things accurately. Instead, they impose what they think is being said. And that's what people have come to believe over time. But the author mentions this desert like demon but it's just another member of Yahweh's council another Elohim that got banished to the desert because the Israelites considered the desert a type of like hell so it gets banished to the desert or the wilderness and in ancient times the Israelites would sacrifice goats like Yahweh told them to sacrifice goats to Azazel for their sins. And so they would make the offering of a goat to this entity Azazel on the command of Yahweh. Does that not sound a bit wild and contradictory to what we've come to understand? Why would a God, if it's the only God, command his own people to make sacrifices to another God. You can call him a demon all you want to. And that's what is done. If you read this book and you read the Bible, it it is quite apparent that any, any entity that is similar to Yahweh, but isn't Yahweh is just straight up demonized. And like literally demonized, they're just called a demon simply because they oppose Yahweh or they belong to a culture that is not Israel, like Israelite or Judaic. So why would this supreme being responsible for creating all the world and everything, all of the universe, ask his own people to make sacrifices to like some desert wilderness God? The author does not point this out. He just says, oh yeah, that's just something that they did. But me as a reader, like I'm getting like infuriated, like can you please... Can you please talk to the people that you're talking to and say like, yeah, this is a bit 
this i mean it it it, it kind of contradicts the narrative of god being the creator of everything if he then asks his own people to make sacrifices to another god in order to absolve them of their sins he then takes it a step further and says that that also explains why one the Christ, Yeshua, which he never uses his actual name, his name was never Jesus, but the author didn't call him Yeshua, is tempted in the wilderness and that the the Satan comes to test them. But he also, the author doesn't make that, doesn't make that correlation that the Satan, his job is to tempt. So then by his own conclusions, Yahweh sent the Satan to tempt Yeshua Christ, and then offered him all of these things if he would essentially fall. And of course, Christ said no, but he's tempted in the wilderness. And the author draws the conclusion and says that the the demon or the Satan in the wilderness that tempts Christ is actually Azazel, who it's his he is the one whom offerings are made to. He just says that that is essentially like. Christ is essentially the scapegoat that is offered up to Azazel to forgive the original sin. Once again, reading that, you can't read that with, (laughs) you can't read that with a straight face and not think about, okay, then this can't be a supreme being. He kind of just expects us to just accept what he's saying without questioning. And going by the reviews of the book, that's what a lot of readers did. They just go, oh, this is great. I've never seen any of this information presented before. And then they just leave it at that. Like, no questions asked. Not like, wait, what are you talking about? Are you really saying with a straight face that Yahweh, the creator of the entire universe, sacrificed his own son to another Elohim who wasn't really an Elohim, is actually a demon? what? (laughs) And so you're, you're reading this, I'm reading this and I'm thinking, okay, well then the Gnostic, which is a sect of Christianity, they were right. Whether or not this author wants to pull that together, if he was intellectually honest, he would have said, um, maybe there's something to what, if you believe that this God is the God of everything, which is what he wants to convince his audience is true. When I think he has convinced his audience that it is true. Um, or most of the audience, then what you're saying is that he sacrificed his own son to a lesser God to forgive the sins. Does that make, I, 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 <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I know. I know what I'm going to say is like, yeah, of course it doesn't make sense. The Bible is full of contradictions, but at what point do people just stop and go, okay, enough. If anything, what this book taught me was, okay, there's something else going on. I woke up with the idea of the thought of magical servitors. Look it up. Magical servitors. I've thought, I've talked about thought forms before. I've talked, I've talked about tulpas. And I also want you guys to look up magical servitors. Magical servitors are entities, non-physical entities, non-physical entities that can be summoned using magic. Now, I don't practice magic. I'm just telling you that it is out there. And I've mentioned books on chaos. I think there's a book called Chaos Magic. I mentioned it sometime last year and I was like, I'm not recommending you go read the book because there's actually like, he tells people how to use this stuff. I would not recommend it. I personally, and this is my own personal disclaimer, I enjoy reading and I like to know that this is going on. Like he talks about how to spot when spells have been used. So it's good for me to know that this is, going on and he also talks about how to protect yourself but i would not practice this stuff because at the end of the day i'm only when i'm conscious when i'm awake and when i'm aware i can sort of move and i have my intuition and i sort of understand certain things but i am not that bold to assume that i would know much about the quote-unquote unseen realm and what these entities are. So I would absolutely not consciously summon anything into this world to do my bidding because I'm not wise enough. I don't have enough access to data. And even if I did, I still wouldn't mess with it because I'm just not that person to summon things into this world that 
may have a better understanding because they can exist in both worlds and retain information and memory of both worlds in a way that I cannot, at least in this moment in space time. My higher self can, but when I exist in the 16 hours that I'm awake in this reality, I can't. And there's just, there. I don't think they have to sleep, these entities. So I personally will not mess with it, but that's not, that's not to say that there haven't been people who have and continue to do so even right now. Okay. When I read the book, the unseen realm, as I'm listening to it, I'm thinking about magical servitors. Like I said, I woke up with thinking about it today. I'm thinking about tulpas and thinking about thought forms. And I think about parasites. I actually said this, um, in a, I'm going to just read it to you guys because it's, it's worth you guys listening to. I had an interview that I did on the God souls, um, lectures and working with, um, with Sam, uh, a filmmaker that also listens to the podcast. She was a special guest shout out to Sam, but there was a section where I talked about parasites, um, particularly parasitic entities. And I want you guys to just listen to this. Okay. Okay. So everything in this world is inverted. Everything in this world is an inversion. We are told that there, that there is something that needs you to pray to it in order for it to be, in order for it to exist, right? It wants you to pray to it. That's what we're told this God is. Right. But it's not, it's, it's a named God. And as the Tao said, anything that can be named is not, (laughs) it's not the God, right? That's, that's something that's giving form. You're giving it form. It's taken form. If it can take form, then how is it different from you? You're a non-corporal entity in form. So why do you need to worship it? Anyway, that to me is a parasite. Anything that needs you for it to exist and move in this reality without giving anything back. Because listen, if it gave things back, the people who believed in it, I'm talking about Yahweh, this, this entity that many have worshiped for thousands of years and have died for, why would they like, then you would know that every Christian, you know, would be living pain-free lives, prosperous, prosperous lives. You would know, (laughs) by their lives that they are taken care of. Like, I need you to really sit with that because that's something that sort of woke me up. Like I remember as a child, my, my grandmother would talk to me about her God, about Yahweh. We shall name it. Not the gods of her ancestors. I mean, my grandmother being an Igbo woman, right? She did not grow up with this religion, but she adopted it. So she didn't tell me about the gods, quote unquote gods, of her ancestors, she told me about this Christian God. And she said, if you pray to it, right? If you offer it your praise, it will protect you and it will give you anything that you want. And then I just watched over time, even as I prayed as a child, I watched things, bad things happen to my, my parents. I watched, I lost my little sister. I, I went through some stuff I'm not even going to like talk about on here because it's, it's okay. Like it, it is what it is. And it didn't click to me. It didn't make sense to me that I, I prayed. The, the only things that I'd asked for was just for my parents to be okay. And for my little sister, my family to be okay. And for my grandma to be okay. That's not what happened. And remember my father is a whole pastor. He's been on dialysis since I was like 17 years old. This is a pastor. So that didn't make any logical sense to me. Why are the people who su- who are giving up and sacrificing their lives to this entity, why are they suffering? Why aren't their lives any different from the lives of others who don't worship this entity? And in my experience, it seems like even some people who don't practice any religion tend to do better than those who do. And some could make the argument that, okay, well, your reward or their reward for, for, for following Yahweh is waiting for them in heaven. Okay, but you should also make sure that they are at least comfortable on earth if he is the God of everything. Anyway, anything that demands praise without giving anything back that just drains is a parasite. Anything that uses fear 
threat of sickness, of damnation, of physical illnesses, emotional terror, castigation, and a fear of judgment is not a God. That's a parasite. So the underlining story I'm trying to tell here is that you have energy. You have consciousness. Consciousness is this cloud. Think of it like a cloud, right? And then in the cloud, there's, it holds water. Okay. And when water, when it rains, the clouds will come down in the form of liquid water and the clouds will take the body of a lake and it will take the body of a stream and it will take the body of a pond, but it's existing. It's water existing in different forms. It could also take the bod- body in a bottle, right? And it could also take the body of just one drop. But as it comes down, everything in a lake, in the ocean, in the river, in a bottle, it's in a drop. It's all one thing. It's water. So now if you exist in physical form here, you are more powerful than anything without a body. Because your consciousness or your spiritual being, just like all of these other beings, except you have a body. You have the ability to affect change in this reality. These non-physical beings cannot without you because they don't have a body. The body is only a, it's a vehicle. You only need it to be able to affect change in this reality. So if they cannot do things in this reality without you, then that's a parasite. There's a reason why these so-called gods can't show up and move things. They cannot influence anything in this reality directly. It's interesting because in the book, The Unseen Realm, the author acknowledges this, that one of the abilities of a human body, of the human being, is to be able to create vessels for these spirits to inhabit. That was an, that was an ability that Elohim, and Yahweh specifically, imbued the human being with to be able to create bodies for these gods, these entities to exist in. Think about that. When an entity requires people, humans, to sacrifice their children or their animals and to spill their blood so that they can feed off the energy of blood, and this is a recurring theme, that should give you pause. Throughout all cultures across all of humanity, there are entities that pop up that are worshipped as God that require blood sacrifice, that require fear, that require submission, that should give you pause. You are not allowed to ask why. You are not allowed to challenge things. In fact, going back to the unseen realm, what the author repeatedly states is that the Nahesh and other demons, their only sins against Yahweh is that they rebelled and they refused to accept that Yahweh was the only God and that they weren't gods and the supreme gods. It was rebellion, it was pushing back. And then it seems like some of them actually wanted to take corporal form and then have sex with human women. Which, once again, does that sound like something? Does that sound like something the creators of this entire the entire everything, not just this reality, but literally everything would behave? Or does it sound like something, something else, something much smaller and much more manipulative and much more exploitative would do? (laughs) The purpose of me saying this is to serve or trigger for you to pay attention to that, okay? That anything that requires you to bend to it is not a god. It is a parasite. Let's think of kings and queens. What do they say? 
bow to me. I'm your king. Call me your majesty. Worship me. Raise me up. Give me your taxes, right? Pay on to me. Those are just, they're just humans. All, all they've done is claimed that they're superior to you. And all they've done is demanded that you give your hard earned money back to them because they say that they are superior to it, to you. But at the end of the day, they're just humans. They're not superior. They shit just like you. They eat just like you. They may dress up in expensive clothing, but at the end of the day, they're just human. They're not better than you. They just have convinced people to bow to them and to give to them. They're parasites. If you truly were superior to me, you wouldn't need me. I don't need to attach myself to a form if I'm greater than that form. I can just do whatever it is that needs to be done on my own. If I have to do that, that's a tick. You are my food and I'm feeding on you or I'm using you for something that I cannot do for myself. How is that a God? If something shows up in a non-physical form and says, pray to me, fear me, give me your attention, your veneration, your energy, and you say, okay, <laughs> you need to stop. Because if it was a God, it would not need you. It would just create its own body. You have a collective consciousness, right? What do the Hindus say? That God wanted to experience the actual God. The God, collective consciousness wanted to experience itself in different forms. And so it took different forms. Me, you, right? Collectively, we are God. If it wanted to experience itself in different forms, in various forms, and it's already doing the thing, it already has the ability to take on different forms, why would it need you? We are already embodied. We are already consciousness embodied in form. It doesn't, it wouldn't need us. In my opinion, I think that there is a race, a species, a non-conformal species. Star Trek actually has done, done this in a few episodes, right? I do think that you have to take a, a step back, and I'm going to talk about this at length with the God series, um, the God Soul series. But Cliff Notes version, you want to take a step back and you want to look at, to go back to my point about there just being more than seven continents. You have to first understand that you are non-physical. Here's a quote from a book called Your Invisible Body and the Quantum Universe that I really want you to think about because it kind of made me go, oh, I like this. I love this. Here's, okay, so most scientists today accept that 99% of the multiverse is invisible. 99% of the multiverse is invisible. So every current physics textbook says so, which means that only 1% of the multiverse is visible to us. So the obvious question is, when you look at yourself in the mirror, are you seeing 100% of yourself or just 1%? Do you also possess an invisible body that you are not aware of? See, we are limited, extremely limited by our own, by, by, the, by the senses of this body. If you can only see 1% of what is actually there, then what you're looking at right now can't be all of me. He goes on to talk about auras and things like that. And he, he talks about or describes the black sun as well, at least what I termed the black sun. Um, the book is worth reading. Oh, I should, I should, I just started it. So I'll probably have lots of clips from there as well, as well but it's called Your Invisible Body and the Quantum Universe by Ishan Rami. I believe that's Rami. Right. Um, but there are bits of you that you can't see. There is 1% and then there's 99% that you aren't able to perceive while in this reality because you only exist in this reality to affect change in this reality in this form. But that doesn't mean that this is all, this is all that there is. And I love that. Now, if you, if there's an unseen version of you, then there are also unseen things, unseen forms or unformed things, right? I've asked in past episodes, can sound itself be a consciousness? 
And you actually see that happening in the Bible, right? Where the, the Christ is called the voice. To me, the author did not allude to this. To me, though, it seemed kind of on the nose um, that the word of God could have just been a non-physical <laughs> presentation of this servitor or tulpa that is now posing as a god. You don't need these things. We're already here. Affect the change in this reality that you need to affect. You are already a spiritual being existing in this form. You need to be more in contact with your own self, with your own spiritual self. Anything that you need outside, you feel you need outside of you, you possess within you. So lean into that. The better approach would be, how do I clarify all this noise and strengthen myself so that I believe wholeheartedly in the things that I'm able to do in this reality and outside of it? But it starts by understanding that you are more than what you perceive with these five senses. Clearly, we are 100%, for those who are visually unimpaired, we are 100% dependent on what we see. And as I started this episode talking about, just with something as simple as a camera, you can't trust it. You cannot trust what you see on your camera. If that can be altered, gosh, who knows what else can be altered in reality itself. Case in point, sun color, sun white now, even though emojis yellow, memories of sun yellow. I don't know I'm talking <laughs> like a character from whatever. I don't know. Um, but do, do bear that in mind that if that, that can happen on your phone, you just you take something and it doesn't match. The inverse can also happen. Everything is inverted in this reality. So whatever it is, that this thing needs you to give praise to that. That's a parasite. I had a conversation with a friend of mine. We we're talking about yesterday how there are people out there who will pay thousands of dollars to go to some lecture. And I'm not going to name any names to be motivated by some individual who will have a three day retreat that will get your dopamine going. And people are spending money they don't have because they believe that if they can go to this lecture and listen to this person talk, that they will have enough motivation to get their business going. And so they're giving their time, their energy, their effort, and their money to all of these, to these sort of like gurus who really all they want is adoration and money. And my response to that will always be, what happens if you took that $3,000 that you paid plus your flight to go and watch somebody give you a pep talk and present information that you can get on YouTube for way less than $3,000 and you put that into your business instead, and you put that into yourself instead, what does your life look like? Right? But these people that present themselves as another form of false, false gods are just human beings presenting themselves as gods. I mean, that's what it is. That's what it is. That's another kind of parasite. I'm not saying <laughs> I'm not saying that everybody who has, you know, something that they're promoting is a parasite. I'm just saying that if you find yourself continuously going to something that so much so that you're dependent on it, so much so that it's breaking you, like you're spending money you don't have to go and listen to somebody talk to you about something that's just going to motivate you for a little bit, redirect that to your own self. Put that energy back to your own self, to your own business. Invest in you. I'm not saying don't support them. You guys know how I feel about, hey, if you've got a business, you know, promote yourself. But if you're continuously doing the same thing over and over again and you're not getting any progress, at what point do you stop and go, let me invert that and put that back into myself and put that back into my business and put that back into my family? Anybody that needs the collective, you know, praise of the collective or money from the collective to exist, to survive, and they need you continuously dependent on them, that's a parasite. 
I can walk away from 300,000 <laughs> subscribers or whatever, or 20,000 viewers. I don't like follow, calling them followers or whatever. It doesn't mean anything to me because I can, I'm self-sustained. I'm all right. My, uh, what I enjoy doing is edifying and encouraging and sometimes entertaining, but I don't see myself ever reaching to a point where I would encourage people to spend that kind of money to their own detriment. That's not all right. And to use, I'm not saying that, you know, these gurus do this, but the sidestep that like to go back to other false gods that have come up in the past to use fear and threat and blood sacrifices and rituals and all these other things in order to essentially provoke people to behave in a particular way to give to them. That's something worth paying attention to. Really. That's not an actual God. The one, it's so funny that it's the one entity that's calling other gods false gods. It's like there's an old African proverb that says when you point the finger, well, the other fingers are pointing back at you. I just want you guys to think about that. I think I've got everything. I think I've got everything. 1% of the universe is what's visible to us. 1%. If that doesn't freak you out, but also blow your mind, I don't know what will. That freaks me out, but it also blows my mind. Because it, it tells me we don't know shit. <laughs> we literally, there's 99% of this universe that we're not aware of. And so I will be the first person to tell you, like, I don't know what I'm talking about. All I can do is present information from my extremely limited point of view and perspective based on the very limited data that I've acquired. I've read a lot of books, but I've not read all of the books. And even if I was able to read all of the books that are available to the general public, I will not have access to books that are not available to the general public that contain knowledge. So all I can do is one, operate from the standpoint that like, look, I'm just telling you what I'm thinking in this moment and I'm sharing you my information, do with that information what you will. Um, if you feel some type of way or you're the kind of person who spent thousands of dollars to go to talk, to listen to a, a guru, a motivational speaker, you know, tell you every year the same thing in just different ways, okay, do that. Like I, I don't, that's not my place to say. And I, I don't even know 100% if maybe that works for some people. I don't know. It doesn't seem like it does if you're, because the people, like I mentioned this in my last podcast of like, I know a woman who religiously goes and follows a certain person, um, Tony Robbins, I don't care. <laughs> like he's, who's watching this? It's like you guys, like, hello guys. I know all of the people that are watching my videos. So anyway, yeah, it's Tony Robbins. And it's like, she's still living, like she lives in a garage and she does nails, right? And she's spending all of this money and she like doesn't like where she lives, but she's trying to better herself. And I'm like, that's not okay. Like, can you take the money that you're giving to somebody who already, like, he's fine. He doesn't need that. And put that into you, into your business. Like, I know what she feels like she's doing. That she's, well, she's investing herself in the knowledge. But gosh, like, b buy a book and read the book. I'm not saying don't buy the book, but gosh, you don't need that. And a lot of the things that people are saying, like I said in the last episodes of the short, the 13 minute video I posted and audio, work within your comfort zone. You know, this is one of the first few podcasts I've, I've been doing where I'm now, I'm now on camera. Normally I don't, I don't have lights when I record a podcast. I usually just sit, like I'm actually in my closet if we're being completely honest and it's dark and I've always kind of felt like I wouldn't be able to do a podcast with lights on. I just need to like sit and just talk. 
because that's typically how I do it. But I was like, well, let me try it this time. I'm comfortable. This is my comfort zone. I am comfortable now in front of a camera. It wasn't always, but I am comfortable now, right, in front of a camera. But I didn't push myself. I didn't force myself to be, you know, in front of a camera. I just, I worked up to it. So I started with the podcast and then I told you guys in that, in that short, like, well, it's not a short. It's a short for me as we're an hour in. <laughs> it's a short for me, but I said in the 13 minute long um, episode that I, I just worked up to it. So now I think this is one of the few episodes. It's not going to be a, vi- a video on Spotify. It's still going to be sound because I tried the video option on Spotify, but like people are having issues with it playing. So the video will go on YouTube if you want to watch. Um, and then it's just going to be sound on all, you know, on Amazon. I'm sorry. Not, well, yeah, actually on Audible and um, iTunes and every, everything else. But I didn't start like doing things that, that made me uncomfortable. I don't like being uncomfortable. I don't know how many people do. You know, but she's saying, well, people like this Tony Robbins guy is telling people um, to do things that make them uncomfortable. I mean, I guess if that works for you, but I'm not a masochist. Like, what about people who aren't masochists? Uh, A a gentleman left a really great comment. He was like, how does that apply to introverts versus extroverts? Because sometimes you're also pushing introverts to do things (laughs) that aren't comfortable for introverts you know like that's they don't have they're not the same people so if i'm a speaker and i'm an extrovert and i like doing shit that makes me uncomfortable but i'm telling people that listen to me that that applies unilaterally across the board introverts might adapt that and it may not work for them and there's no acknowledgement of this. Like the, a lot of these people who come out and they say these things, they, they there's never a disclaimer. There's never a caveat to say this may not apply, you know, across the board for everybody, <laughs> you know, and I may not, I, I don't, I may not even know what I'm talking about. I'm probably full of shit, but if this works for you, fine. Like nobody's saying that. And I, I don't understand how people can sort of operate from that state of just like absolute, like I know this is right. I don't even have that level of confidence to tell people what to do with their lives in that way. Like, please don't do shit because I told you to do shit. Like, just this is my opinion. And this is where it works for me. I might say things with a certain level of, like, conviction. But ultimately, for example, in the video I said, like, this is why I quit social media. I encourage you guys to not be on social media because it didn't work for me. I don't like it. And I explained why, but hey, if you feel comfortable doing that and it works for you, do you. But ultimately, I'm still right. You still have to do what makes you comfortable. So if you're comfortable doing that, do you. If you're uncomfortable doing that, don't do it. Life. I don't want to say you only live once because that's not true, in my opinion. (laughs) It doesn't seem true to me based on everything that I've read. Right. But I do know that we only seem to or appear to remember just one incarnation at a time. And it will throw a lot of curveballs at you just naturally. Why add to it your own discomfort when you don't have to? I've recently just, um, my friend Maya, she actually um, recommended, she just out of the blue, but it stuck with me. I didn't realize how much like unnatural like synthetic fabrics i wear a lot like not this like this is 100 percent you know cotton like the t-shirt and stuff like that but like like my sweatpants i wear a lot of sweatpants but they're not cotton and then i was like in bed because i couldn't sleep it's like five o'clock this morning i'm just laying there and like everything i'm touching is synthetic right like my blanket is like some sort of poly thing like alternative like down because i don't want birds to get plucked for my comforter also they're less expensive it's like 30 bucks for a blanket um but i was like gosh this bed is synthetic this blanket is, is synthetic oh my socks are probably synthetic like i'm not wearing anything natural and i decided to rectify that and i just started looking for american companies that make like clothes that are a hundred percent um cotton or linen and organic And I found that, yes, they are more expensive than like what you can get for shine or whatever. But um, my skin can breathe. It's not this. I'm waiting for them to come. 
or whatever. And I'm testing out a couple of brands. And when I figure out what works for me, I will share with you guys. But I just want to pass the information to you. I do feel better when I wear cotton. And I'm actually now, like, it took me a while to learn to read the ingredients in my food. And now I'm, I'm now, within the last week, starting to learn to read, like, the labels on my shirt. Like, okay, what is this made of? And I, I will tell you, my skin does feel like it's breathing. And if you think about it, your skin is your largest organ, right? You It absorbs things. And so if you've got for all the 18 hours, 24 hours, you just, you're just wearing synthetic stuff and plastics and, you know, toxic dyes and stuff like that. Like, I feel like, I don't know if long-term that's the best. I don't know if long-term that's conducive for your health. Um... But gosh, it's certainly something to think about. You know, we are now just learning of like forever plastics. And I forget what they're called, like PF, I think PFACs or something like that. But gosh, microplastics as well. Who knows what, what else? So just being aware of the fact that like from any point in time, what you're doing that you have accepted as just, okay, this is just the way things are and I'm just going to operate, can change. And that new information is always coming. And that you may not have all of the information. You No, not even may not. You 100% do not have all of the information. I, I just remember I was going to talk about aliens. Um, <laughs> you may not or do not, you absolutely do not have all the information that will be beneficial to you. And it's okay. But as you get new information, adapt, change, grow. So that's my path this week. I'm getting a new blanket. It's from this one company. I don't remember, but in the future, I will talk about it. But made in America, the cotton is grown in America. It's organic cotton and it's like handmade or something like that. It was like 200 bucks, but it's going to last. And I don't know, I feel better. And maybe that's something that people, more and more people should start paying attention to. Maybe we don't have to buy as much shit that we don't need, but maybe instead of buying things that are made in China, China, <laughs> don't you think it's weird that like a sitting president is going to get indicted? It's so wild. We're living in some very strange times. All right, sign sideways. But yeah, I, I'd rather buy something that I know where it's made. Even like our vitamins, being mindful of now, like looking to see, wait, where is this made? Where is this grown before you put it in there, in your body, in your mouth? Like what sort of regulatory practices are happening in this country that this thing that is going to go in my body and I'm going to now absorb, this is my physical temple in this reality. How am I going to treat it? Anyway, back to alien. So I think that there are more than the seven continents that we see. That's my, that's my conspiracy theory. Um, and I do think that even in the immaterial world, the unseen realm to steal this guy's title, the, the non-material world, there are, there's gotta be civilizations that are unseen, unseen civilizations. And I think that outside of the seven worlds, the seven continents, there are entities that I'm not even going to call them entities that they're, they're probably human or at least humanoid. And I think that there was a period in time when they infiltrated our world. They came here for whatever reason. You can make the argument that they came, maybe they, maybe they traveled through time. I don't know, but they certainly came to our world and started sort of affecting change in this reality. And I am absolutely certain that it's also happening right now. And I think that that's who a lot of God souls are, but not all God souls are good. I think the individuals that, that are more conscious than most, right? Remember I said that consciousness is the cloud and then the, the cloud exists in different forms, right? And as water, a cloud will rain, it comes down, the water comes down and it can be in a lake, in a stream, even in a bottle of water. It's all conscious. I think that non-corporal entities, that's still a type of consciousness. And just like there are parasitic people, there are parasitic spirits. I think that you are a spirit existing in a body, but ultimately it's all consciousness. It's just 
somebody has convinced you that, or these entities have convinced you that they're superior to you. We've seen this even with human beings where one technologically advanced civilization will happen across another, not as advanced technologically. And I don't even mean that the way it sounds, it's just, maybe they just, their technology was more science-based, was more nature-based, was less science-based and more nature-based is what I actually mean. Right. And it was a more spiritual technology, magical technology than the physical one that we've now come to venerate. All right. And then they essentially bully the other cultures into believing that these, these cultures are supreme are better or superior and their ways are superior. And that essentially like they should be worshiped. We're, we're seeing it. Or thankfully more and more people are waking up and realizing that that's not wait, there's no culture superior to another, but gosh, they did manage to convince the majority of humans existing right now that they were superior. I'm talking about Europeans. Just didn't want to be on the nose. Um, <laughs> right. But thankfully more and more people are realizing like, wait, what, that, that was not, I always call great Britain. Okay. Britain. Cause they're just okay. Like I don't, but that was like, you know, a hype that unfortunately the majority of, of, of humanity fell for. And I'm saying that the same thing has happened. I think that outside of the seven planets, I'm sorry, not planets, outside of the seven, um, continents that we're aware of, there are other humans that are more advanced. And by humans, I mean, consciousness existing in form. And I think there was a period in time when they descended into this section of earth and started like kind of taking advantage and maybe some wanted to teach humanity, whereas others wanted to exploit humanity. And I'm, and I do believe that you pay attention or you should pay attention more to what's the stories of like them taking on form in their incarnations, because that's something that repeats across the board, across all religion is that these spirits do take on physical form. And I'm saying that that never stopped. It's just the expression changed. So are there false gods and actual gods? And by gods, I only mean it as higher levels of consciousness and awareness. That's it. Because everything is still part of the collective consciousness experiencing itself in different forms. Everyone, even NPCs, which I've said not, I've termed or have labeled not potently conscious, they are still part of the collective consciousness. It's just a different form in which the collective consciousness has chose to inhabit. But anything that you can perceive and that is embodied, even if it's on a sort of a, a corporeal or non-corporeal form, but you can still perceive it on some level, if you can hear its voice, for example, or it appears in a dream or as a mirage or whatever it is there, it's still part of the collective. The collective is God is the true God. Anything else beyond that is just the, is just the collective experiencing itself in various forms. So I think that's what aliens are. They're just humanoids. And only humanoids in the sense of just a corporal, a non-corporal entity that has chosen to take the form of a human body in a human body. And maybe the bodies that they have taken on are just different. Like it's just a different technology and more advanced technology than the ones that we're in right now. But if you pay attention, these beings, however superior, keep sort of procreating with the humans that they meet and sort of moving with them and, you know, having, uh, um, uh, what's it called? Nephilim or dev demigods or things like that, which I, like I said, I'm going to delve into really deeply in the God soul in the God soul series that's coming up. Um, but I think that's really what's going on. And so if you exist with a higher level of consciousness, right, you would have been considered a God. It's just, it depends on how you want it to move 
like a thousand years from ago or 2000 years ago. My leafy hall said that, that they were just quote unquote, great men. A lot of these gods were just great men. And he also said that a lot of them existed as in human, in human beings, as human beings, Thoth, Thoth, the, the Trismegistus, Hermes existed in physical form. So what I'm trying to say, I'm beating the nail on the head is that you have to look beyond that, that there are, there are non-corporal beings. You're all non-corporal beings that take on form, that take on physical form and take on human form. And that these are what are called gods. But if you are, if you are a, a person or being with a certain higher level of awareness, intelligence, consciousness, right. And you had a time machine and you went back in time right? Where there was less technology and you were able to move in certain like circles, you would at a, at a certain point would be considered a God. That's facts. It's, it's the same thing that, you know, that, that occurs now that is occurring now, right? We, we, there's an, an innate sort of veneration for human beings who possess higher levels of consciousness, higher levels of awareness, higher levels of abilities, even but it doesn't mean that they're superior. It's just like a lake is not superior to like a pond. It's all the same. It's just some people may have exploited those differences, whereas others, and I believe that there are factions, um, chose to help humanity. And I think that's, like I said, I keep saying, I think it's happening now. And that some are aware and are consciously affecting change in this reality for better or worse. And then I think that there's some who on some level suspect that they are God souls, which we just define as greater levels of consciousness, but they're, they're like almost doubting themselves because that's part of the game is like, you have to sort of overcome that. There's a certain level of amnesia, but nobody is superior to anybody. It's just greater levels of consciousness and that's it. But how does that all fit into the simulation hypothesis? I think it fits in neatly. If this is an ongoing simulation and that consciousness constantly inhabits form in this physical reality, quote unquote physical, it's really not. It's actually a hologram. It's a holographic universe. It's, it echoes. It's the same thing as like, like the movie avatar, right? For, for the human beings to exist in their world, they just took on a form. And it's the same thing as when you play a video game for you to affect change in, in a virtual reality, you just take on form, but you're not really superior to anybody that's kind of playing. It's just playing within the game. It's just a certain level of like awareness. Now, are there in game bots? There are, <laughs> and we've got to kind of play with that and figure it out. I got to work that out. Um, but obviously my idea is that it's not as many like the true, 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 just straight up bots, NPCs, just program is not as many, but even if it were, there's still a certain level of consciousness that has to exist within them in order for them to exist in that reality. If you go back to the biblical story, when, when the Elohim are said to breathe into the forms of Adam and Eve, that was essentially the transference of consciousness in order to give them life. And as I've talked on past videos, uh, it, there's, you know, a certain level of panpsychism that you have to adopt, right? That everything with a goal is inherently conscious on some level. And some have argued that even electrons themselves can be conscious. And then it's just concentrations, right? So it's just uh, as a spectrum, what, what is the, what is the cutoff point and where does it start? Right? One drop. Okay. Drop, drop, drop until, okay. Now it's a bottle. What is a collection? All right. So even quote unquote NPCs where, where we shouldn't dismiss them, right? Because they're still conscious. It's just not to a certain level. And as I've said in videos before, where I talk about redefining NPCs as not presently conscious or not potently conscious, as I later on went to define, when you, when you take in the multiverse, you understand too, that as a consciousness shifts through the multiverse, 
a body that could contain a certain level of just a small enough level where it is just it's sentient but it's not fully conscious on a certain um level a more conscious spirit a more conscious entity can shift into that form at any point in time and th and thus activate that body and like a drop being added to or like a bottle of water being added to something where it's just one drop and now grows it and then that form can now exist in the reality that you find itself as a more conscious being to the point where even a god soul can do that and inhabit form okay i hope that was not too confusing if it was just replay this a couple of times <laughs> i will continue with these discussions as i've said and we're going to break it down i just want to kind of get you guys primed and ready to go so we said a lot up an hour and 27 minutes not bad not bad see my my internal monologue was telling me like i don't know if you'll be able to do the podcast and be co coherent with all the lights and i think i did all right anyway thanks for listening i'll catch you next time